All right, we are live with Investor Live, and today we are talking about entrepreneurial finance. And Woo. we've brought from behind the scenes Jason, Master Jason Martin, and uh, oh. and it's a perfect opportunity because uh, Jason is as entrepreneurial as it gets. In fact, you're so crazily entrepreneurial, you, you work with us. That's right. <laughs> so welcome today. We are talking about entrepreneurial finance. And Jason joined our team uh, just over a year ago. And Jason was a, an entrepreneur from the get-go. You, you did go to college. so I did go to college, yeah. Yep. I got my graduated. degree. Yep. So like a good entrepreneur, I think your GPA was what? Uh, 2.3 or something? Uh, 2.5 was the minimum to get by, so it's probably floating around there. Don't quote me on that. So. Made the parents happy, though. I got the four year degree. That's four year all. degree? That's what's important. So maybe you're not really a real entrepreneur because you should have really dropped out or something. Like that. I know, that's kind of my. That goes against me. You know, it's, you had that Sky District, those pretty cool business cards. Yeah, yeah. Kind of Imported business cards from London, see through. Nice. They're pretty snazzy. That's probably a pretty fancy part of my business. <laughs> hey, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of it's all about design, right? Yeah, that's right. Excellent. And uh, so, on a on a serious note, we are chatting with Jason today because we're talking about entrepreneurial finance. Uh, Phil and I have uh, I don't know if it's a, the pleasure or the misfortune of having spent uh, a lot of years and a lot of hours buried in Excel sheets. Uh, between the two of us, it's uh, easily over 10,000, if not 20,000 hours with our noses uh, buried in Excel uh, files. And we've done a number of transactions, as you guys have heard in the past. Phil's done a number of corporate finance uh, uh, deals, projects related to energy. So it's a bit unfair, but by default, those are big. So he dealt with uh, more zeros than I've ever seen. Uh, it was in the billions. Uh, when I've done projects, it's more in the millions, so much more in the grasp of uh, the startup entrepreneurial community, getting that $2 million to get going. And so we've been on that side, but we're also entrepreneurs. But uh, we're going to chat with Jason today and try to answer some of those questions around entrepreneurial finance. What are the things in and around finance that are uh, common questions and things that are, are good to know? Cool. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so let's just start. When you, when you hear entrepreneurial finance, Jason, what comes to mind? By the way, this is all unrehearsed. We have no scripts in front of us. So. Yeah. With so. this, we're doing this on purpose to kind of, uh, and, and also tweet us out your questions at Investor. We'll watch our mobile devices to uh, see if we see some questions. Okay. What do you think of entrepreneurial finance? What just comes to mind? Yeah, well. I took an entrepreneurial finance class in college. Excellent. So I kind of floated around the topic a little bit. Um, what did you learn in that entrepreneurial finance class? Or what, what topics were covered? Well, that's a good, good question. Um, what actually did you show up to this <laughs> class, Jason? I showed up. <laughs> they gave us a Warren Buffett book that we read on our spare time. So let's get this straight. And that was about uh, the, 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 the wealthiest person in the world runs one of the biggest companies in the world. That's where you learn entrepreneurial finance from. They gave you a book, book by Warren Buffett. That's yeah, we had a book on the side with Warren Buffett. Fellow entrepreneurs, if you're not seeing some irony here, but uh, about financial statements. Okay. So uh, we grazed over financial statements, pro forma, uh, a little bit of cap table stuff, so kind of broad, broad everything. Okay. Yeah, so what's up? Financial statements taught by Warren Buffett yep. himself. Pro forma taught formas. by my professor at the time. Okay. Ran a couple small businesses. So what did you get out of that entrepreneurial finance class? <laughs> was, was it just an easy A and you moved on, or I mean, what did you uh, remember? What you kind of got out of it? It was a lot of group work. So we put our heads together and we're okay. trying to get our projects done. So. We actually, this is one of our capstone courses at the time, and it went with some of our business planning courses. Okay. And we were supposed to tie those two projects together and come up with some basic pro formats and things like that to present to a panel of investors that didn't matter. So what's a pro forma? What's a pro forma? Right. <laughs> well, let's, I, 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 well, I'll answer a pro forma. I mean, it's, it's a forward-looking financial statement. Yeah. Right? It's, 
pro forma is probably Latin or Greek or something, or pro forma, I don't know. But it comes from the whole concept that it's it's a forward-looking statement. So it's not what happened in the past. It's what's hopefully going to happen in the future, or I guess what's going to happen in the future. Right. So they taught us about um, coming up with assumptions on how your business model works and how you can pick that apart and be able to explain it to different investors or even to okay. key members in, in your company. So the, the the assumptions that went into it. Okay. Yeah. So how do you make money? What is what does each thing cost, and how do you turn transactions? Okay. So your entrepreneurial finance class, and in entrepreneurial finance, what comes to mind is um, financial statements, uh, pro formas, forecasting those financial statements. Yeah. Uh, what else did you say? Uh, uh, cash flow. Cash flow statements. Okay. Yeah. So the other things that uh, that come to mind when I hear entrepreneurial finance is things like valuation. Uh, it's a very very sticky subject. I've I've done a ton of stuff around valuation, and even practitioners of valuation that are doing valuation work have a hard time defining valuation. But like it or not, it's it's critical because you bring in a co-founder by default. You know, you put some money in a checking account. There's uh, whether you acknowledge it or not, there's valuation that's happening for, for that company. Uh, so that would be a big thing that comes to finance. Yeah, one uh, more thing was uh, the alternate forms of financing. So whether it could be bootstrapping or borrowing loans or angel investments. Which you can. Okay, so the... Uh, How do you get access to them? Okay, so the capital. Every business, I mean, that's the, the, the basic definition of a business that requires capital. And so, what form does it take? Is it is it equity, stock? Is it uh, is it debt? Um, you know, how how are you going to get this thing going? Maybe you're lucky enough to have a really sh strong business where you can get enough money by just doing what should be done and just selling product and making enough money to build the business. So, cash flow once again. So, cash flow characteristics are very very important because that's answering the question around. Do you need outside? What do you need outside money? Are you, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about like LED lights. LED lights are a technology that costs a lot of money to build these things. It's overseas. They get stuck on ships. It's uh, money gets paid out before you ever get a return on that money. So that's a very different cash flow characteristic than producing an online course and selling it and getting that money immediately. And, not having to spend additional dollars to actually make that sale. Yep. So very different characteristics. Uh, I also think about mergers and acquisitions. When we're dealing in the world of startups and entrepreneurs, most people aren't thinking about mergers and acquisitions per se, but we've seen it a number of times where entrepreneurs will get a business started and there's a similar business to it and they will merge uh, or they'll get acquired, especially in the tech space. There's a lot of acquisitions that happen uh, to just to buy talent. Google, Apple, Aqua hires. Aqua hires. Yeah. Good term. Yeah, that's that's right. Aqua hires. That happens all the time. So an entrepreneur needs to be ready to think about mergers, acquisitions. How are they going to deal with that when the day comes? And along that same vein, we might as well just say exit strategies. Because every business is going to be looking at a potential exit someday, so a sale of the business, or maybe a piece of the business. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there's a product line that gets developed and is no longer fit that can be sold, or the whole company is sold. And once again, same thinking around mergers and acquisitions you may not be to pursue an exit or a sale of the company, but somebody comes along. What's that going to look like? What are the founders? What are the shareholders ready to um, to put on the table? Yeah. So, any other it's a lot, a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of moving parts. It's Different almost topics. It's almost hard to talk about entrepreneurship and startups without talking about finance. Yeah. I kind of think about it. Right. I mean, it's, everyone can have an idea, but it's, then how do you get it started? Right. Right. And it's usually going to involve some sort of money. Get it off the ground. Well, exactly. That's it's you know business is all about building an economic machine. Is that what you say? You know, it's building something that hopefully you're putting a dollar in and two come out the back end. But uh, 
some businesses put two in and get a dollar out the back end, but uh, it's all about that economic machine, and that is the world of finance. So we've got some questions that we've heard along the way. Once again, we're hoping to uh, tweet us out at Investyr, I-N-V-E-S-T-Y-R. Uh, we'll be able to, to see that on our, on our mobile devices and uh, answer your questions. But we have some questions that we've heard on investor live sessions in the past and uh, in our work in the entrepreneurial community. So um, one of the first questions is, is, what is finance and what is the difference from accounting? Uh, is there a difference? Do you have any thoughts, Jason? I mean, when you think about finance, accounting, what are your thoughts? How are they different? How are they the same? I'm putting Jason on the spot a little bit today on purpose. You didn't come prepared with no, I didn't. questions because I we get to test the waters with an entrepreneur. Well, entrepreneurial finance, I feel like, is more about access to capital and grow in the business. Where I see accounting more is kind of a statement in time. Statement in time. There you go. So much more time sensitive. Looking back, yeah, that's. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it. I, I see the world very differently. Finance is very, very different from accounting. Now, accounting can't survive without finance, and finance can't survive without accounting. It's, they're, they're related from that aspect, but this is today. Accounting is historical looking. It's the things that have happened in the past. Something had to happen for you to account for it. It's, it's, it's a rear view mirror, it's looking back. Finance is everything in the future. It's the performance, it's the valuation. And that's where it meets the accounting and finance at this moment in time, the present time, does come together. Uh, when you're talking about bringing in money and valuation, some of that, that's stuff that's really happening in real time and today, those two worlds meet. But the world of finance, forward looking, accounting, historical, that's how I. That's how I've always thought about it. Cool. So I'm one for one. I got that right. That's right. There you go. There you Chalk go. that up. So we're, we're, we're doing well here. So um, another question is, is, is hiring an accountant or a bookkeeper the same as having a CFO, also known as a, um, a financial officer, a chief financial officer? And is that one and the same? How do you see the world, the difference between a bookkeeper, an accountant, a CPA, and a CFO. Do you have any thoughts on how you would silo those, or are they one and the same? I'd say they're separate. Okay. Um, you can go ahead with this. Okay. I you think know. they're two different roles. Yeah. Strategy-wise, you both need to be held accountable for it. You need to have the right position, so to be able to handle those responsibilities. Ooh, I like that. I like that. So. I'm going to take that and run with it. Um, strategy. Let's look at a continuum. You know, a bookkeeper, an accountant, a CFO, they're, they're all touching numbers, if you will. They're, they're, they're utilizing um, accounting and, and looking at numbers in some way, shape, or form in financial models. But as you go from bookkeeper to accountant to CPA to CFO, the amount of strategy goes like this. A CFO, a real CFO, the high, high majority of the time should be on strategy. Strategy, the finance strategy. And a CPA and accountant, much less so, because once again, they're historical looking, they're, they're making sure that what you did in the past is, is right and buttoned up. So they're not looking forward as much, but they can, they can definitely you know, help shape some strategy. Um, and then a bookkeeper, very much less so. A bookkeeper is essentially somebody who's doing data entry. Now, bookkeepers are, most good bookkeepers are earning much more than somebody who's just strictly doing data entry because they need to understand how to utilize tools, uh, on, you know, accounting tools and so forth and making sure they understand where some data debits or credits going. But at the end of the day, they're entering data into the system. And then the, the accountant, CPA, double-checking stuff, CFO is too. But then the CFO is 
you know, maybe a co-founder or a major shareholder, or they definitely are at that level as an executive have a, a financial stake in the game. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be much more focused on the strategy. So I like how you put that. Thank you. So we're doing good for I making know. this all up on yeah, the fly, right? Yeah, it's So when we get the question, is hiring an accountant, a bookkeeper, the same as a CFO, uh, the answer is always no. And now we just put in, in, in better words than we probably ever used in the past. But an accountant, a bookkeeper, historical looking, CFO, forward looking. So the high majority of startups, even small businesses, really can't afford a CFO. They're more in the world of uh, accountants and bookkeepers, so they definitely need to be because they need to have some type of financial statements. But uh, that's where, you know, having a, a finance strategist on the team is absolutely critical. And maybe a, a, a board member, whether it be a board of uh, board of directors or advisory board member or uh, somebody like us, uh, uh, we've done this work for a number of companies to be that finance strategist that can really come into play. So, cool. Uh, one big question that we get a lot is, I'd like to ask you now, oh, is what are the fair. what I'm are the basic documents the that what are the basic documents that a founder should have prepared? Financial documents when he's going to seek funding, or just even if he's not seeking funding. Uh, well, that it's a great clarification and a great point. You know, at the end there. What documents should someone have ready to talk to an investor? And then you clarify and say, well, it doesn't even matter if they're talking to an investor, what should they just have ready? And it almost, at the very, very early stages, it should be one and the same. I mean, every company needs to have a pro forma. It needs to have a financial model that understands the cash flow characteristics of the business. What are the economic drivers of the business? How are we getting a customer? How much does it cost? What is that customer going to buy? What did that cost us to produce? Uh, and what is the economics of, of that business model look like? Uh, there's really no excuse not to have done this work in some way, shape, or form. Because if you haven't, you're kidding yourself. You, know, you, you truly don't understand why you're even spending money on building the business, let alone spending any time working on it. If you don't know that you want to build a SaaS-based company and have subscribers that are paying X amount and it's going to cost us this much to get a subscriber and produce the content and the thing it is they're subscribing to, then you shouldn't be in business. Uh, and so well, having having that baseline is very important. Yeah, so I think one thing for early founders can be intimidating to get behind the Excel and start creating this beautiful financial model or something, but I think you can get into it just as easy on a notepad and start writing down how you turn transactions. So what do you have in your head? Right. And, and that's just for start, just starting to think, you know, how are you going to make money? And, 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 yeah, yeah, very, very Before you start getting into one Yeah. If that's something that intimidates or scares the heck out of the well, the ironic part is, you know, I've, I've lived this world and I breathe it, and it scares me. You know, to, when you're doing it for other people, it's actually, you know, kind of easy and it's fun. But when you have to do it for yourself, you know, I, you know, I'm always reluctant to do it for uh, things I'm working on and personally involved with because it's just, for some reason, it's a little bit different. But there's always that natural hesitancy. It's uh, kind of like going to a doctor for a physical exam, right? I mean. There's only so much you can look forward to it. It's, you know, it's really, really important, especially you know as you get older, or in this case, as your business gets bigger. But it, it's important to have that analysis on the table. And so, I think a good tip for entrepreneurs to tackle this is the way you put it: you know, open up a Google Doc, uh, put it on the whiteboard. As different ideas come to mind, jot them down. Start sketching out what do the economics look like. Uh, you know, even if it's rough, you know, is the cost of acquiring a customer going to be a dollar or five dollars or a range of ten to twenty? Whatever the guesses are, start putting it down there. And then over time, you know, as you get an MVP out or the business gets going, you can start to better define this. That's why we're big into agile financial model um, and helping entrepreneurs understand where and how they should best spend their time because to 
spend too much time to you know guess that it's going to be exactly twenty two dollars and fifty cents to acquire a customer and build out a big fancy Excel model is probably not a great use of time. It's somewhere below that where you're acknowledging that you don't know some things and that's what you're trying to figure out. You know, that's what we're doing. We're A B testing all the time. Is it is it, you know, cost a dollar or ten dollars to to get someone to, to buy an online course. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like your idea of just jotting it down. The other thing is too, and this is a little bit more advanced, but uh, seeking out industry insights. You know, there's entrepreneurs are doing a fabulous job these days of blogging about their businesses, especially in forums like Reddit. You know, we can get some very intimate details. You know, this is how much it cost me to acquire a customer. This is the journey I went on. Yeah. And so if you can start to learn from that and point to it, you're very advanced. And even taking a look at what some of your competitors are. Right. You know, a lot of them have their pricey models waiting to be posted on the website. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so even just kind of taking that and you know, estimating what you can sell stuff for and you know, putting it out there. Because it's all about trying to understand where you need to be. Because if, say, your cost to acquire a customer is $20 and you know you need to sell your product for $35, and all of a sudden as you're ramping up that business, you're realizing it's costing you $30 to acquire a customer and you're having a hard time getting them to pay more than $20, you're upside down. And so when you're doing financial modeling, uh, and pulling that information, you can start to recognize those things uh, quickly and start making strategic decisions. Do we pivot? Do we change the product? What are we doing here? It's so critically important these days. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about cash flow. And Love cash flow, positive cash flow. Positive cash flow. One all question all we cash get does flow. Let's point that out. If you like it or not, all cash flows exist. It's a matter of those who recognize it and especially understand uh, uh, where it's flowing to and from. <laughs> There's a river run deep. So, what's a burn rate? Uh, a burn rate is just generally accepted as how much money a company is utilizing in a given month. It's usually quoted by a month. So, people, if an investor ever asks, what's your burn rate? They'd probably, you'd probably say 20000 So, the they're saying, okay, I'm burning $20,000 a month. And they're often asking that because a burn rate is very applicable to the world of startups. Is how much money are you consuming uh, to get the business up and going? You know, for a startup, you're paying developers, you're got sales staff or designers or whatever you need to build your business. And you're being paid uh, whether you're making money or not in, in, in the high majority of cases. Okay. So what is then the runway? So the runway is a term that's definitely considered um, or a way to ask people, you know, how many months or how long is it going to be until uh, you run out of cash? Um, or a runway to uh, break even sometimes. But when I hear runway, I think maybe running running out of cash. So uh, cash or uh, Burn rate and runway are kind of the same, but op they're opposites. Right? Yeah, it's, it's how much money you burn in every month. And Versus a runway would say, time, yeah. yeah, if I got $200,000 in the bank and my burn's 20000 a month, well, I got 10 months runway. Yeah. I got 10 months runway to either bring in more capital or to get the, the business somehow the cash flow positive. So I like to always think about runway or you know, how long is it going to take until it's cash flow break even? That can be a dicier question, especially these days with uh, uh, a good number of tech companies who are building a strong user base. And that would not have been a very good question for, for Twitter, right? You know, because um, in a number of other companies, um, you know, WordPress, I don't know the economic span of WordPress, but um, the company behind it, uh, Automatic, you know, it was all about building the user base and the adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of models like that. Yeah, which is very, very popular model. So, so where do people go to learn this kind of stuff? 
Well, they can come to us. That's why we're here. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Good answer. That's, that's why we're definitely here, is uh, to answer any and all questions related to entrepreneurial finance. Uh, there's a decent number of resources online. Uh, it can get awfully, uh, awfully cluttered out there. Uh, universities definitely teach some aspects of finance. There's uh, some of the courses are now uh, posted on open courseware. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really up to the entrepreneur and the founder to, to learn some basic financial modeling skills, some some basic understandings of valuation, of capitalization tables, and and without a doubt, they need to own the strategy. They need to own what to think about when it comes to mergers, acquisitions, exit strategy, bringing capital. Especially the smaller the company, the, uh, the earlier stage it is, they can't be outsourced. And so there's a lot to be said for peer-to-peer um, -peer learning. So that would be my biggest answer there for entrepreneurs is really learning from other entrepreneurs. It's the best place to get resources, asking other entrepreneurs how they block and tackle some of these issues. And you know we're we're a facilitator of peer-to-peer -peer learning, helping entrepreneurs access other entrepreneurs to get the insights that they need to be successful. Cool. Because we could lecture all day on modeling, that doesn't help so much. But it's it's uh, talking about where and how to utilize it efficiently. And like you said, I mean most people don't like to do it and, and have ADD when it comes to some of the administrative stuff. So. It's all about how to make it uh, easier and hopefully a little bit fun. Mm -hmm. so, what do you think? What are the resources available? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think there's. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of different places online that you can check out, whether that's online free courses or university settings. A lot of different high level blog posts and stuff like that. But I think. You kind of got to start brainstorming on your own and really get down and dirty with it. And I think that's what you'll learn the most. Kind of practicing, thinking about it. Right. So, with that, uh, you had asked uh, a question early on we didn't fully address. You know, what, what should an entrepreneur have ready and available and as it relates to investors? And we believe that. Um, a very basic financial model will do. It doesn't have to be an in-depth whiz-bang thing, but it has to have the basic elements of understanding the economic engine of the business. What What is it going to take to get customers? How much does it take to produce the product? And that's what that model needs to be able to, to demonstrate. But, and it's so important because you've got to be able to speak to it if you're talking to key influencers or investors. Or exactly right. Fellow team members. Right. You, you really can't be, it's really hard to build your business no matter how you slice and dice it without it anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's a do, definitely a document that needs to be in your uh, back pocket when you're out talking to investors. Absent just out there building relationships with influencers and investors very early on. Because uh, you can never start early enough building rep, uh, relationships and reputation with them. So early on, I think it's okay and fine to acknowledge that you're, you're still putting numbers together. Um, but you know, as you get closer and closer to seriously looking at bringing outside investment dollars, it's a must-have document mm -hmm. for a couple reasons. One is really protect the entrepreneur. If you've got a fabulous business model and so forth, then that reflects your valuation. You know, if you've got something that could generate tens of millions of dollars in free cash flow over the next few years and it doesn't take a lot of money to get the thing done on the front end, then that's going to dictate the valuation of the company. It's going to dictate the kind of money that is brought in. Maybe you try to keep it closely held. Maybe it's something you can do with you know, friends and family or people you're close to, or um, even getting debt, whether it's straight debt or if it's convertible debt, but something that would be uh, cheaper than selling assets. 
So it really is going to drive uh, all the decision making that should happen in the course of uh, the finance strategy as the company uh, builds and grows and executes. So, yeah. What else do we have? Uh, let's see here. Just going to see. Uh, see if anyone sent any tweets in here. So we got uh, technology working. We're looking for any questions regarding to entrepreneurial finance. We're happy to uh, we got ask any questions. Someone here is asking in terms of uh, crowdfunding. Sure. As it's actually his name is John. Yeah, definitely. So John M, uh, thanks for giving us a shout out. And uh, uh, hopefully, I, I know you travel a lot. I wonder if uh, you're in town. Maybe in, maybe you're in Europe. Having a beer, like everybody is. That's days. yeah. That's where that's where Phil is. We forgot to mention that. But, uh, but John asks about uh, thoughts on on crowdfunding as it relates to entrepreneurial finance, and it's a fabulous question because crowdfunding is definitely a term that has really taken hold of the headlines over the last couple of years because of things like Kickstarter and AngelList in the concept that entrepreneurs are going to have broader access to capital because of digital media platforms. And crowdfunding, as it relates to entrepreneurial finance, is, uh, is a fabulous tool. Um, when it comes to rewards-based crowdfunding, like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, where you are essentially allowing for um, people to give you money in return for a reward, which is oftentimes the product, or some type of items that are related to the project, uh, such as a copy of the CD when the band gets going. Um, that's a fabulous way to bring money in. It's a fabulous solution for entrepreneurial finance. Um, when you distill it down, crowdfunding is really nothing new, but uh, there's a lot of energy and focus on it right now, so uh, ride the wave. If you've got the opportunity to Resell a product. If you're producing um, hats, uh, and you can go out there and show people your designs, and you can go sell hats and do a Kickstarter campaign, you can bring in a bunch of money that are uh, ahead of time, and then go out and produce your hats. It's a fabulous way to, to finance your business. Yeah. You didn't give any any equity away from your company. And yep. And you didn't give any yeah. equity away, and you were able to, what we like to talk about is get fans on board right away. Yeah. People who are passionate want to support your project or your business. It's a, it's a very, very powerful tool. Now, uh, in the next few days, actually next Monday or Tuesday, crowdfunding in the equity world is going to uh, hit the headlines heavily again because... Um, Companies will now be allowed to advertise for investors to bring investors into their company through what they call general solicitations. So advertisements, putting out on LinkedIn, hey, we're looking for investors. Um, I would caution everybody, everybody to do some heavy due diligence if they're going to look at utilizing this exemption. And when I say exemption, I mean it's a exemption to the rules of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, if you don't have any familiarity with the securities laws, rules, and regulations, you do need to seek uh, professional insights and advice. There's a lot of good blogs and a lot of good articles out there that will give them to you, but uh, people are definitely going to want to understand what is this and what are the real implications of utilizing advertising for investors, uh, because it's not as straight and clear cut as one would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, I've read, I've read the Jobs Act a number of times. I've read a number of the rules and proposed rules around it. And even someone like me that spent their whole career in finance and, and very familiar with the, the regulatory bodies, I still have a hard time understanding all of it because the biggest problem is is that. Uh, you're not just dealing with the SEC, it's also um, FINRA, which oversees all the, the broker dealers. It's the state securities commissioners. 
So depending on what state you're in, it could have different implications. Um, and then there's also case law. So any any letters to file or any documentation of lawsuits that have happened actually have an implication on our securities regulations. And uh, sounds like it could get pretty messy. So <laughs> if it sounds convoluted, it, it is. You know, a person can't even take a minute or two to really explain all this stuff is besides just saying, do your homework, understand what the 506C exemption is when it comes to advertising for investors. Because I'll tell you right now, there's a couple things I'm concerned about. Is One is called an integration issue. Uh, if you use a 506C offering, you're kind of bound to utilize that exemption in terms of within the SEC for the next 12 months. Well, for some companies, that could be a real death blow because you're limited on who you can bring in in terms of investors and the amount of money. And uh, if you've got a weird look on your face, it should happen because it's it's not clear cut. Um, I tell you, being what I think is just pretty knowledgeable about this, I would have a hard time, you know, saying or justifying what type of you know exemption I would utilize or how I would really utilize. Advertising for investors right now. It's, it's, uh, Take a lot of entrepreneurs and get themselves in some hot water here. That's what really stinks about the Jobs Act and, and everything in general is it's uh, it's n another one of those things where I think it's going to cause people to be set up for failure, which is just really really sad because the people who really pushed the Jobs Act and wanted to see it created have awesome intentions. We really do need some significant changes in our securities laws, but the way the rules went into effect and all the nooks and hooks to it are really going to be um, going to cause people to um, getting into territory that they're not familiar with and frankly even a lot of securities attorneys really even have a hard time putting their heads around because there's so many different so I'm afraid that that will be the case for a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners, that it could be um, a misfortunate trap. Just kind of and I, and be I don't, careful of what you're doing. Yeah, and I don't want to throw cold water on this, but it, it really reiterates why our whole platform is absolutely critical to the entrepreneurial process of, of finance. And that's, you need to be out there building real relationships with real people. People invest in people. They're not going to invest because of a Google ad campaign or postings on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Craigslist. That's not why money moves. And that's why it's very, very important for entrepreneurs to understand that they can go about the fundraising process in large part without having to worry about securities laws and rules and regulations because at the very premise of it, uh, it's all about building relationships. And yeah. you can start that way before you ever need money in your business, which is absolutely critical yeah. to get that started. And so a lot of the investors that might bite on some of these ads and things like that, a lot of them are probably going to get pretty burned. Yeah, every investor I've talked to said there's no way in heck they would uh, invest because they found something by an ad. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, is if you did find something to invest in because of an advertisement, that issuer, so the company that's going to issue securities or is bringing in that investor, that issuer is now going to be required to um, do a, a, a full monthly uh, review. You know, they're going to have to verify income, verify net worth. So looking at W-2 forms, looking at income tax statements, you know, you know, I've invested in several things. There's no way in, no way in the world I'm going to hand that stuff over. It's a real, for a big reason, it's a real pain. I actually don't mind all that much if they were to see some of that stuff, but it's a pain to pull together. I don't even know how I would pull together, you know, think about my tax filings and stuff like that. I mean, it takes some work to, to pull all that stuff together and to verify income. Mm -hmm. But it's um, but it's extremely invasive, and 
the ironic part is investors have so many choices in life. If I'm a real investor, I'm a real investor, you know, but if I've got real substantial net worth to invest, you are talking five, ten million liquid, I can invest anywhere in the world. I could be buying you know, Mongolian currency and investing in, you know, Chinese phosphate. Uh, I could be doing you know, all sorts of things um, where I could earn a return on an investment. Mm -hmm. And so, what is my motivation to invest in an early stage company when I'm going to have to, you know, pull together all this documentation to actually prove mm -hmm. to them that I'm worthy of investing? Yeah, and plus it takes, so, it takes the whole people aspect. And when you look back again at what an angel investor is, they're investing in the person right team behind it. So they're getting pitched on an idea first. Right. It's kind of going against the whole point of it. Exactly right. And this is a crucial point that Jason that you've made is it's critical that entrepreneurs are building relationships with people. They're not pitching an idea or a project, they're building relationships. Because everybody naturally shut down. Human beings naturally shut down when they feel like they're being marketed to. This is why we shut down when a beggar walks up to us at the street. This is why we shut down when somebody gives us the hard sell when they knock on the front door. This is why we shut down when uh, certain websites or banner ads get very intrusive about buy now, buy now, buy now. I mean, over and over again, there's a whole knowledge base that has proven that human beings do not respond well when they get a hard sell. And so and that's absolutely true in the case of early stage investors. You know, nobody wants to, you know, be, uh, nobody really wants to be pitched. That's the ironic part is investors really don't want to be pitched. They want to have conversations with real human beings. And explore a business opportunity, but they don't want to be, you know, sit there for a half hour and just like, ah, here's all this information coming up. Yeah. I think entrepreneurs are naturally going at a million miles an hour, so they're trying to fight for their life to keep the company going. Right. But they need to have some confidence and learn to be patient in the process. That's a and great way to put it. Let it happen. Right. Let the relationships happen. Right. Rather than trying to get in front of everyone's face with the vision to keep their money. I like it. Let the relationships happen. That's, that's a great way to put it. Is, uh, and when you think of it that way, once again, it continues to support and argue for the case that people need to start right away. Mm -hmm. You can't be sitting in a the closet these days and working on your business. You need to be out there talking to influencers and um, constituents right away and sharing some thoughts and ideas and getting feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some awesome points. We're, we're, we're way over time, but that shows you what uh, some good content we, ideas we got going here. Not to toot, not to toot our own horn, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. I'm, I'm kind of jazzed up about this whole concept. Yeah. So we got uh, refreshing here, see so if we got any more questions. Go back to that other screen up. Uh, so we're just going to look real, uh, real quick. If you have any more questions, because we're kind of on a on a roll here. But um, um, so one of the, you know, one of the questions that does keep coming up is, you know, people always want to bring it down and distill it to the very basic pieces. What are the basic things I need to know as an entrepreneur? some of the questions we're getting here. What are some of the very, very basic things that I need to know? As an entrepreneur, you, you do need to know some basic spreadsheet modeling skills. Uh, it doesn't have to be Excel anymore. It could be in a Google spreadsheet, but uh, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to get into hardcore coding, but you've got to be able to put some numbers in a, in a, uh, in a cell. If you can't do that these days, you're probably not going to make it as an entrepreneur anyways. Uh, but you got to be able to stick some stuff in a spreadsheet. You've got to be able to own and operate a computer mm -hmm. so you can get to that spreadsheet. 
So some of the basics are you, you need to be able to put that in there. Um, you need some finance strategy. Some of the basic things are you need to understand the, the strategy of finance as it relates to your business, as it relates to your industry. You know, what is the economic model? How are people going to make money? What are going to be the things I need to spend money on to be able to make money? So you definitely need to have some of that finance strategy so you can put some numbers in Excel sheet. What are some of the other really basic things that, that people would need to, to know as a founder? In terms of entrepreneurial finance, you know? I would, another thing is, is, you know, these days, you need to know the basic concepts around what is finance, what is accounting, some of the things we talked about. You need to understand what is a cap table, what is valuation, and how do I determine valuation. Uh, those are some critical aspects that, as a founder, you got to know these things because if you don't, you might as well go work for somebody because you're either going to get fleeced uh, along the way or you're going to utterly fail because you gave away too much of your company as you built it up. Yeah, it'll be hard for you, I think, in the position of the CEO to not be from Right, yes. Yeah, and a cap table, it sounds like it might be complicated stuff, but it's literally knowing who owns how many shares, which boils down to what percentage of the company. And as you bring in additional money, how does that affect how much you own and how much everybody else owns? And I guess I've always been surprised at how part of the concept that is for, for a lot of people. Um, but it's a hard concept for you. You gotta be. In, you gotta make it not a hard concept. You gotta. You gotta understand the basics of of, uh, of financial. You know, financial accounting. You know, what's driving the economics of the business. Um, who owns the business and who's going to own the business over the time. Mm -hmm. Gotta understand the basics of a capital structure. You know, what's the difference between equity and debt and you know, how am I going to pay back debt, and can I even get debt, and if not, how am I going to get equity, and what forms could that take, preferred, common shares? And how do you structure the equity from an investor standpoint? It can say a lot about the team, too, how much uh, each guy putting in, or each person is putting in, right. all, and how you guys kind of allocate it. And tell a lot about the personalities. So. Oh, very much so. And I think in a lot of times for angel investors and in VCs, I mean, this is a litmus test. This is a test to see how savvy a, a team is. And if somebody walks in with real no concept of, uh, of a cap table and how different uh, tranches of, of securities work, whether it's debt or equity, that could be a big red flag for potential investors. Now that not that it's a knock. It, I mean, people don't have to be experts in it, but if you're to the point where you went out and talking to real investors, you better have read like Brad Feld's book on uh, uh, startup valuation, or no, VC terms. You know, there's Venture Hacks, the blog, the Founders of Angel List. There's a bunch of free resources there. There's a yeah, ton of blogs great. out there. But you got to read, read this stuff, and not only read it, but have a, a basic understanding of what it's all about. And that's why we're here. You know, a ton of our materials touch on this stuff. Uh, we don't get into like VC terms, like because there's a ton of that stuff already out there. But it's really helping about the the strategy of finance. So, so with that, I think we'll wrap up. We've got our new course out this week. That's called How to Find Investors. It takes some of our best materials and helps people understand how to be efficient in the journey of identifying influencers and investors and getting in front of them. And this course is material from our master course, which uh, we encourage you to check out on our site, uh, investgear.com. And uh, you can get 75% off that course right now, so it's an awesome deal. Uh, we're building our base of learners, so um, we're offering some fabulous deals for people to get on our courses. Uh, and check them out and give us the feedback and we continue to add more and more material every week. So um, come and join us and join our community of learners. Uh, 
Uh, we're available for our learners uh, at all times to ask questions, and we do a lot of uh, in-person events and then some online events like this every week to uh, to give back to the entrepreneurial community. Yeah. So not only is there really good content in the How to Find Investors course, but there's also over 200 students already in the last week, and so yes. in that class you're able to communicate with other course students and have some Q and A and ask us for help, et cetera. So there's a social element to it. So. Yes. Yeah. We. Yeah. I think you point that out. We love the social element of it too because it's really all about peer to peer learning. Uh, we'll we'll give you everything you need to know, but. Boy, when we've seen the rubber really meet the road, it's when entrepreneurs talk to other entrepreneurs and learn from each other. It's the, it's the again the point where to say it's the only way to go when you're an entrepreneur. It's, you've got to you've got to learn from your peers. So, with that, and that could be a whole other topic. On, uh, we've been how, well, how much of an advantage it is to have a network of other. That's a great call. Well, for various reasons. Let's do that for next week. Peers, et let's yeah. do that for next week. It's all about peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning, so sometimes peer-to-peer -peer lending. So with that, Jason Martin, he is our growth hacker uh, extraordinaire, Patrick Donahue. Uh, we really appreciate you coming out today, joining our uh, our webcast, and uh, ping us anytime with questions, emails, and, uh, and share this. We really appreciate uh, spreading the word and helping entrepreneurs get better access to capital. And, making sure that that entrepreneurial journey is as efficient as possible. So with that, thank you. Thank you.